He who is cruel to animals becomes hard also in his dealings with men. We can judge the heart of a man by his treatment of animals. Immanuel Kant Before I researched this episode, I vaguely assumed that the use of snares was now illegal in the UK. It isn't, and I'm embarrassed not to have already realised this. In fact, not only is it still legal, you can buy about 10 rabbit snares online from well-known online retailers for not much over £10. If you doubt that, try googling the phrase, buy snare traps. Let's be absolutely clear. The use of snares to trap wildlife is, at best, ignorant and lazy. At worst, it is sadistic and obscene. A snare is a fixed noose that kills an animal with their own panic and terror. Any animal who gets such a noose around their neck has no way of understanding what is happening to them and naturally tries to escape. In the process, they slowly and agonisingly asphyxiate in terror. Excuses have been made that snares can just hold an animal until a person can arrive to humanely dispatch them. This is a lie. Even if they are still alive, they will still have gone through a horrendously painful and terrifying experience. Let me make it clear that I am not a vegan animal rights campaigner, though the continued legality of snares moves me more in that direction. I accept that wildlife populations can need controlling from time to time, but if you are going to do so, then at least use a method that will cause as quick and painless a death as possible. There is no excuse for using such a cruel and fundamentally lazy method as snaring. There is a campaign to ban the use of snares in the UK that I fully support. They can be found at antisnaring.org.uk. That's one word, antisnaring.org.uk. I am truly saddened to say that my neck of the woods, Sussex, seems to be a particular area area of concern for this campaign. I have no qualms about opening this episode in this way, as this podcast is not supposed to be a substitute for reading Watership Down or watching one of the film versions. There will be plenty of spoilers as we proceed through the book, particularly when the narrative throws up such contemporary issues as this. Watership Down may be set in a supernatural world where rabbits can talk, but that should never distract us from this world, where their suffering at our hands is no less real. Chapter 17. The Shining Wire. The opening quote is from W. H. Auden's The Witnesses. Whatever the wider themes of this poem, this extract tells of uh, green fields coming off like a lid as an unpleasant reality is, is revealed. Disturbing figures are mentioned, such as the scissor man, as the trees seem to gather round to watch. Would those trees by any chance be trees in November in this case? Hazel is dreaming again. He dreams of the roof being made of bones, then of yew tree twigs. Then Cowslip is urging him to carry red yew berries in his mouth to eat in the great burrow. Yew berries are poisonous. Fiver begs him not to. Bigwig joins in, his mouth full of the berries. Then they are outside in the cold, and the berries have become like red droppings. Bigwig's words at this point foreshadow the horrific events that unfold later in this chapter. As Hazel wakes... He realises Fiverr has gone. He wakes Bigwig. They realise Fiverr must have gone outside. It is too early to do this, so they both go look, looking for him. They are angry. They first look under the yew tree, but he is not there. Bigwig can see the track he has made in the wet grass. Following this and passing through a hedge, they find Fiverr feeding near where the flay rar is left, though not touching what is left of it. Hazel just starts feeding beside him and regrets bringing Bigwig. However, Bigwig expected Hazel to speak first, so he is silent. They feed together quietly. Fiverr suddenly announces that he is leaving for the hills. When Bigwig says he will die if he leaves on his own, Fiverr responds that they are closer to death than he is. Bigwig starts to lose his temper, and Hazel has to calm him, saying he can see Fiverr is genuinely scared of the place. 
He is going to go with Fiverr a short way. He asks Bigwig to go back and tell the others what is happening. Bigwig turns on Fiverr and unleashes his temper on him, telling him he is going to turn the others against him. Then he dashes back through a gap in the hedge. Instantly, there is the sound of something dreadful happening, as if something has caught Bigwig. Going through the hedge, they see that he is caught in a snare. The scene resembles the strange place they found the previous day outside one of the burrows, leaves thrown up, the earth scored bare by his claws. The copper wire of the snare is tight around Bigwig's neck and runs to a peg in the ground. His neck is bleeding. Bigwig struggles, then is still. His mouth is bleeding and froth has emerged from it. Hazel desperately asks Bigwig what they should do. He just manages to reply that it is useless to bite the wire. They need to dig the peg out. This scene, for all its horror, requires a large suspension of disbelief. Of necessity, this book is set in a world where even talking rabbits can be killed by a snare. So they have some understanding of how the snare works, unlike rabbits in real life. They know that the wire is too strong to bite through. They also know that digging out the peg can save the victim. The one thing they seemingly cannot realise is the one thing that makes a snare work. It does not even occur to them to move Bigwig closer to the peg, which would instantly remove the danger. A person in a snare could save themselves straight away. To kill a human with a noose, they have to be suspended off the ground with their hands tied together. But this selective ignorance in rabbits is essential to maintain the reality of the Watership Down universe, however unlikely such selective knowledge may be. Bigwig convulses again and is still. Hazel tells Fiverr to run and get the others. He then tries to understand what Bigwig said and scratches at the ground until he begins to find the peg. Blackberry joins them first, followed by the others. Hazel asks Pipkin if Cowslip is coming. Pipkin responds that Cowslip told Fiverr to stop talking about it. Blackberry has worked out to dig out the peg. Hazel starts digging, followed by Silver, then Buckthorn. The peg is exposed but still in place. Blackberry suggests sending the smaller rabbits in to bite through the peg. Pipkin starts, followed by Fiverr. Despite cutting their noses on splinters, they split the peg. Bigwig lies still. He seems to be dead. He may have broken his own neck or pierced his windpipe. Hazel realises he has to get them away quickly. The man could be on the way and they need to try to not think about what has happened. He utters the famous line about his heart joining the thousand, quote, for my friend stopped running today, end quote. The exact meaning of this rabbit funeral service seems, saying seems unclear, but it is, it is still a beautiful saying. Does it mean your heart has joined the Lil or another thousand? Hazel desperately appeals to Blackberry to help him. He cannot see Fiverr, so distracts himself by telling Pipkin to clean himself up. He asks him to say more about what Cowslip said. The rabbits of the Warren had ignored Fiverr. Then, when he went up to Cowslip, he had struck Fiverr, scratching him. Suddenly, Bigwig's voice rings out. He is alive and very angry. He looks terrible. His back legs are weak. Silver says they should drive the rabbits from the Warren and take it for themselves. Several of the group agree. Fiverr shouts out a shocking lapine phrase in desperation, which basically means stinking god. This is Fiverr at his most powerful. He lays out what has been happening and they listen in silence. The Warren is snared every day. He offers them the story of this terrible place. It was once a fine Warren, then it was hit by the white blindness or myxomatosis. A few rabbits survived. The local farmer realised he could farm these rabbits for their meat and pelts, so he shot any predators and started putting out food at some distance from the warren to make them get used to going to it. Then he started snaring them, just enough to make sure he had a good supply of rabbit without scaring them away. They became big and healthy, but also strange in their ways. They all knew what was happening, but dared not admit to it. Their strange ways became a way of distracting themselves from the reality of their situation. They had no chief because a chief could not protect them from the one danger they faced. Their poet spoke of dignity and tried to convince them that all rabbits should actually welcome death. There was one rule. 
Never ask where anyone is unless in a poem or song. And any actual mention of the snares could provoke violence. Fiverr continues with what happened when their group arrived. A decision was made to integrate them into the Warren and tell them nothing. Their story of El Akrara was not appreciated because it was a source of shame to these rabbits, especially as they were deceiving the storyteller. If they take over this Warren, they will just be living in a place of death. Bigwig, still recovering, asks Fiverr what they should do. Fiverr replies that they should leave. Hazel adds that they should go to the hills. Suddenly, Speedwell spots a rabbit coming towards them from the warren, running headlong. They're concerned he may have their white blindness as he stumbles, but he wouldn't be able to run that fast. It is Strawberry. He begs them to take him with them. Silver suggests he go back to Nildrohain. His reaction implies that she poss is possibly no longer alive, or else his terror has overcome any feelings for her. Hazel feels sorry for him and agrees he can join them. They leave, and a magpie finds a length of wire and a peg lying in the grass. So ends part one of the book, which has taken us from one Warren Fiverr warned the group they had to leave, to another where the same happened again. The Warren of the Snares, to give it its proper name, possibly confirms the supernatural nature of the world in which this book is set even more. It is as if the farmer who is snaring the rabbits has a malign influence over their minds that goes far beyond trying not to think about snares or ask where anyone is. The imagery of Hazel's dreams and Fiverr's comments on this warren remind me a little of the influence of Cthulhu in H.P. Lovecraft's The Call of Cthulhu, where the rising power of a hidden evil in ref is reflected in dreams and visions around the world. So now we have two models of what to avoid in running a warren. One too authoritarian, though that was not the actual main reason for leaving, and one where rabbits have given up on survival for the sake of short-term pleasure. The challenges our travellers have faced so far have severely tested their cohesion as a group, but they have come through these united, mainly due to the influence of Hazel and Fiverr, with the near death of Bigwig the final shock that ensures their unity. They have lost no one. In fact, their group has grown by one. They are heading at last for the hills to the south, one of which is called, it may not surprise you to learn, Watership Down. I'm going to pause from going through the book for one, maybe two episodes so that I can discuss wider subjects around the book and its portrayals. These plans are not concrete yet, so watch this space. Thank you for following this podcast so far. See you next week. Mm -hmm.